So welcome to Digital Ship webinar. Today we are discussing more effective maintenance planning to ensure competent, uh, compliance with rest hours. We have an experienced guest panel today, Anissa Rizvanoli, team leader at Fraunhofer Center for Maritime Logistics and Services, Stuart Bankier, head of fleet uh, personnel development and compliance uh, at uh, BSM, and Rafael Baumler, professor and head of maritime safety and environmental administration at World Maritime University. This is the second webinar from the series Making Crew Planning Easier, sponsored by Fraunhofer, that we are hosting this month. Uh, now, Carl Jeffrey, founding editor of Digital Ship, will provide you some context of today's topic. Thanks. So one of the ideas we had last week was that some of the problems we hear about with crew planning and uh, fatigue could actually be linked to bad software. So maybe we can define bad software as designed by someone who imagines how work is done rather than how, which is different to how work is actually done. Bad software is very rigid. You can't change it or update it and it can't handle much of the complexity we've got in real life with the uncertainties and unknowns and things that are dependent on other things. Um, you're probably quite familiar with bad software. We can say software is bad when it stops us doing what we actually want to do and it doesn't connect with any other software and it makes unrealistic expectations about how long things are going to take. And good planning software is going to be realistic about what it thinks we can do. It can handle a realistic range of uncertainty. It can understand all the things that might happen in the real world and it's easy to update or improve. We're not going to see perfect planning software because the real world has got so much complexity complexity and unknowns but it's a sort of a journey where we imagine software getting better and better and better and more better at predicting what real world is like so that's like the continuing development of technology we use on we see on for an autonomous cars so the theme today is specifically maintenance work on ships so there's a lot of uncertainty involved in that a lot of unknowns a lot of dependencies a lot of other complexities and one of the complexities is we need someone with a competence to do the task and how can we do better at using software to plan that? So first of all, we're going to hear perspectives from Stuart Bankier, who's the head of fleet personnel development and compliance with Bernard Shorter Ship Management. He's also a former lieutenant commander with the UK Royal Navy, and he's based in northeast England. So he, he's told us he uses a military background to bring ideas into commercial shipping in terms of helping people develop leadership, management and communication skills, optimizing the performance of teams and empowering people. And he's also involved in digital technology development at BSM, providing concepts and roadmaps. So we're very interested to hear his ideas about how digital te technology can do more with maintenance planning and competence. Second, we're going to hear from Raphael Baumler, who's a professor head of Maritime Safety and Environmental Administration at the World Maritime University, based in Malmo, Sweden. He's also a former master in container shipping. So he's been involved in a report at WMU where they talked about the culture of adjustment, which is a, a term they use for how some shipping companies have a culture of adjusting the records of the work people did. So, so it looks like people comply with the regulations for work rest hours when actually they work much more. And finally, we're going to hear from Anissa Rizvanoli, who's the team leader with Maritime Scientific Computing and Optimization at Fraunhofer, who's going to talk about how Fraunhofer is helping improve digital technology for maintenance planning and some of the work it did with clients, including BSM, Columbia Ship Management and Carnival Cruise Lines. So I'd like to invite Stuart to give the opening talk. Cheers. OK, um, thank you very much, uh, Carl, and thank you to Digital Ship for the opportunity to um, join the webinar today. And thank you, everyone, for, for, for joining and listening. So just um, a couple of slides I have um, <clears throat> so that uh, just let me um, uh, orientate this a little bit. Um, yeah, just, uh, just to, to give you a flavor of um, you know, the, the, the few points that I have. So just a little bit of uh, background on me. Um, as, as Carl mentioned, um, I spent 27 years uh, in the Navy, but I've been in uh, commercial shipping now since 2013. So, um, so seven or eight years now, and, and it's, um, it's been um, really exciting and, and, um, and challenging. Most of my job really is about the people. I was doing some crew management earlier on, but in the last few years, I've been working at our group level um, with a particular focus on fleet personnel development. So that allowed me to go and visit um, a lot of our ships around the fleet 
And I had the great advantage of not being a superintendent. And when I was on board for say four, five, six, seven days, um, I was able to really take a um, um, fantastic opportunity to look at the crew and talk to the crew without the pressures of trying to achieve so many other things that say superintendents do. So I was able to really get into the, the grassroots of um, how our seafarers are thinking and, and what they're doing. And that, that was a, a fantastic opportunity. Uh, and I, I learned a lot um, about um, uh, what, what their problems are and how they see it from, from their perspective. You know, so I could just sit back and drink coffee and chat in the, in the engine control room or on the bridge and, and just try and get a real insight into, into what they think, which was great. Okay, so um, we in, in BSM have a, a software system that, that tracks our, our rest hours and, and our maintenance planning, uh, and we call it um, PAL, P-A-L, that's a portal active link. So it's designed um, from our Mariapps uh, software team in BSM, and it's part of this suite of, um, uh, you know, um, modules and, um, you know, services and um, uh, things that we provide to, to do all our uh, vessel management. So C roster, uh, just on the kind of top right here, is our uh, rest hour software. Um, and that's generally what we'll be um, kind of talking about today. Plan maintenance, like any, I'm sure, like any other company's plan maintenance system is there to, to achieve it. But it's just how we bring all that together and, and then how does it impact on the individual seafarer, you know, particularly our senior officers who are involved in the planning. How does it affect them? How easy is it for them? So that's, um, that's quite interesting. Giving you a bit of an idea of uh, what it looks like, you know, we can get all sorts of data from our C roster software. And I'm sure the others on the panel, Anissa and, and Rafael will say the same, you know, we can gather so much data, but it's really what we do with the data uh, and how does it impact on the decisions that we make? That's the, the important thing. You know, and, and who needs to make the decision? Is it the actual seafarer on board or is it the fleet manager or superintendent in the office? And how do we how do we do that? Everyone's working in the same kind of domain. We're all trying to get the, the same aim and we all have the same kind of constraints about budgets and uh, owners requirements, particularly as us as a ship manager. You know, we've got our clients and owners um, needs to, to, to satisfy. Um, so, so really important. How do we how do we decide on the exact crew numbers? And we we use the same kind of strategies as I'm sure other companies do in terms of you know adding a particular rank extra on that ship on that particular trade or uh, maybe um, supplying a, a riding squad for uh, three months to to boost the maintenance uh, on a particular vessel. Maybe it's a little bit older and needs more maintenance. So those kind of strategies. So. Um, <clears throat> There's no real difference. If you look in detail about a particular monthly schedule for our people, you, you know, th th this is the kind of planning uh, that goes into, um, into the software really. And um, so you can forward plan, you can prepare the schedule about what's going to happen with your, your, your crew for, for the month ahead. And then at the end of the month when you've actually achieved it and you've looked back, you, you, you then um, <clears throat> can see if you've been compliant or non-compliant and where the peaks um, and uh, pinch points are. But <clears throat> I think one of the things which um, uh, I think I'll kind of mention is that it's all about accuracy of the data and being transparent. Um, people having the time to complete the, the rest hours properly and accurately. So we have a schedule, but how long does it take people to, you know, if, if we're doing it retrospectively at the end of the month and you're, you're, you're adjusting it slightly for what people actually did, and then you're seeing the non-compliances and then people make, of course, people make adjustments because they think that's the right thing to do. They think they're helping, you know, the office by not having too many non-compliances or whatever. So I think whilst we, um, we have much better, um, um, you know, intelligent software to do these jobs for us, at the end of the day, the human is still inputting into that software the data. And if he gets that wrong, then we're getting bad, bad data in, bad data out, and our decisions are not so good. So I feel that um, there's an issue, uh, and, and the first bullet point here, so, um, you know, plan maintenance systems are there and available, our rest hours planning is available, 
But what I feel we don't really do is we don't really forward plan as a team, say the top four, so your captain, chief engineer, uh, chief mate, second engineer, they don't really sit around the table together and forward plan. And that's one of the things I learned from my military career. In, in the military, of course, um, it's different. I'm, I, I'm not saying we, we can adopt exactly the same methodology, but we can take the concepts there. They religiously and rigidly forward plan, forward plan and forward plan. And that, comes, that, that starts all the way out to say 18 months ahead with uh, strategic planning on where ships are supposed to be and for what reason, all the way back to um, uh, like a three month schedule where you know what you want to achieve and then you break it down again into a two week slot. And then you look at two weeks, week one in detail, week two in outline. And from that gives you your daily plan. And that is a cycle that happens religiously. So all the um, kind of um, requirements from each little sub department within the ship's organization, submit the requirements on a Tuesday. The operations officer on a Wednesday puts the plan together, just like scheduling. And on a Thursday, you have a meeting to say, will this plan work? How do we need to um, you know, uh, uh, arrange it? How do we need to amend it? And then it's the basis for everything else that's going on. And so that religiously happens. Of course, in commercial shipping, we can't be so rigid often because of schedules, because of requirements, ships um, change the routines, suddenly the pilot's arriving in 30 minutes and it was supposed to be six hours. So. Um, th there are challenges, but I feel that we don't really tackle the forward planning as humans and look on the table and say, is this going to work? And even if you have a plan and it will change, at least you can make the change quickly rather than having no plan and, and starting from scratch. And it takes a lot longer. And when you start from scratch and it still takes a long time and people are busy, like chief officers, the shortcuts happen. And that's where we, we still have the problems. So uh, I, I think forward planning is still something uh, which even software can help us, you know, with, with that kind of stuff as well. But um, as, as humans, culturally, we've got to grasp the requirement to forward plan, um, I, I think, is a huge um, you know, benefit to how we can arrange what we do on board our vessels. Um, no, bullet number two there, um, C roster, I think. Yes, we've developed hugely better software systems now to help us with um, the rest of our planning and the maintenance planning. But I think we need to leap ahead again and make it even easier for the crew. So when he walks out the accommodation door, he's either wearing a smartwatch or a tag or whatever it, it is, and it's automatic. And so we know exactly then, there's no, no doubt if he's on the mooring station for three hours and 20 minutes, then he doesn't need to type that in. He doesn't, you know, so I think this is where the kind of technology needs to be going um, in, in future. So, um, yeah, it's like, it's, it's like everything, you know, 5G is coming, uh, lots of other things are coming. Data capture is, is just huge. Is it Big Brother? Is it, is it uh, going to be uh, problematic for people to sign up to that kind of technology? Maybe, but... Um, uh, I, I think this is this is where it's going. And even now we're <clears throat> involved in, in systems where we are using um, you know, mobile technology to um, motivate, incentivize our senior officers to take uh, good decisions, for example, with fuel efficiency. So we're using uh, technology there with some KPIs and so the, the master would get a, a simple notification on his mobile phone saying, here's your KPI, you did that really well yesterday, well done, can you do the same tomorrow? So that, that kind of technology is also there, uh, and that's very, very interesting. Um, <clears throat> and and the, the last point on this slide, uh, the chief officer is one of the key guys on board that does all the planning for um, you know, maintenance, particularly on the deck side. You know, deck and engine, you know, pretty different, you know, and, and these days with UMS ships, then um, the cycle sometimes of the uh, engineers is, is a little bit different. Sea passage, really steady and, and, and predictable, and then suddenly arriving in port, bunkers, provisions, stores, and an overhaul, and the superintendent's visiting. So, you know, you get the peak, and, and how do you cope with that? Chief officer, obviously, um, you know, he's a busy guy, watch keeping as well, trying to do all the other paperwork jobs. You know, that's really challenging for uh, a lot of our chief officers and um, they have very little time 
and it forces them to take the easy option. Um, <clears throat> so these are a couple of things that I, I do think about. Um, finally, two points, uh, culture. Uh, I think I think we have a long way to go to change culture in the shipping industry. Uh, and um, I think it would go a long way to helping us gather better data and make better decisions. We, we I think I, I mentioned it earlier, we, we still feel that um, we tell the office what they want to hear. You know, we, they don't want non-compliances. They don't want problems. They don't want emails that say we need another crew member. Um, we get it, we do it, we, we have adopted it, but I think there's still a culture uh, out there that, that, um, that prevents us getting the, the real transparent information across. Uh, and that's really important. And it leads me into, well, I, I think we have still, and we have in BSM, still some issues over uh, inaccurate reporting. And, um, um, and that is a huge safety issue. Um, and it doesn't help us with maintenance planning. Uh, you know, I mean, if they're not reporting properly that uh, an overhaul takes X amount of hours um, properly, how, how do we really make the best use of that data? So these are, these are the kind of challenges. Finally, I think um, uh, a little bit of this, um, um, from my experience in, in, in the military, is bringing a little bit of the leadership culture into commercial shipping. It's not that we don't have leadership commercially, of course we do. But I just, I just, I just think that we need to, um, I, I think we need to tackle it more. We see uh, Ockham, Ventotanko and all our industry bodies talking about the human element and um, TMSA element 14 and um, you know, how we need to focus on the human element more, particularly in relation to safety. But uh, for me, then I, I think leadership is uh, the, the culture, the, the transformational style. It's not so much the, the, the hard situational leadership in terms of organization and planning and do what I tell you now. It's more the, this, uh, the, the, the approach to leadership, the transformational style that causes people to, to follow in the right way setting the right example, role models, um, you know, having that culture where people want to do the right thing. They want to abide by the company's values uh, and report accurately and, and have this uh, really good two-way communication between office and vessel and inside the vessel between captain and all the crew that the doors always open, the, the, the easy communication, the, the coaching, the mentorship and, and that kind of culture. And that leads to better trust, uh, and I think, you know, ultimately better organization, better safety, uh, happier ships. And, um, and on that note, I would say that's enough for me. Wow, that's fantastic. And uh, the, the, on the, just the point of the software side, I really like that point about the, uh, the, the more accurate, the uh, well, kind of if, if people are incentive to lie when they can't meet the plan, that's also saying the more accurate the plan, the more... Um, the less likely people are to lie, which I think uh, brings in the importance of good planning to, in the first place. So we'll, we'll go to uh, Raphael now in Malmo, who's at the World Maritime University and has written a report on the culture of adjustment, which I think you might be talking about. So I'd like to welcome Raphael. Cheers. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. I think you, you can see the, the screen. Yeah. 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 Thank you very much. So I, I would just make a small presentation of what we've done in the past years. Um, and what we came with a, a culture of adjustment is just, just to highlight that there is a, in shipping this habit, as also was highlighted previously by, by Stewart, that, that people in order to avoid problems basically try to adjust basically the records. So I, I will show you a little bit what we've done. So the starting point for us was fatigue in research has been continuously pointed out. Uh, it's never ended for the last 30 years. Every report which is dealing with fatigue and crew is highlighting fatigue as a major issue. And we also have this evidence of fatigue in the casualty investigation report, which seems very much counterintuitive because since uh, I would say 1996 with the ILO and 2002 basically with the IMO, we have two instruments that enter into force, which is the, and now it's the MHC 2006 and the STCW. So we have two instruments, but we still have permanently this fatigue coming in. And so we wanted to investigate what, what is really happening here. What are the people doing on board? How do they record their hours? And, and how do they justify if there is any kind of adjustment of records? Because 
What we noticed also in the literature from the 1990s and also on fatigue and from the 2002, basically 2002, why? Because it's only in 2002 that it was mandatory to record hours when the convention 180 entered into force. So what we have as evidence in the literature after 1990 and 2002, it's basically a lot of conquering evidence of fatigue and widespread adjustment of records, which is also, according to many other studies, it's not limited to hours of work, but let's just skip hours of work for this presentation. I would like to highlight that the quantification of violations and wrong reporting has been suggested in different papers, one in 2006 by University of Cardiff and another one in 2016 in the Baltic. Between they estimated between the first one 62% of person reporting that they are doing wrong reports and another one 69%. So we're not on something which is anecdotal, we're something which is massive. And this is for the quantification, but we were not looking at the quantification. We wanted to have a qualitative research in order to understand how they are doing and why they are doing it. Therefore, we started to investigate three different groups. First, the CIFARES to know their practice, to understand their practice and if they confirm the previous data. After we wanted to know about the maritime stakeholders, including shipping companies, to understand what they are doing to achieve it and if they are aware of the problem and, and how they are trying to tackle it. And also to cross-check what the seafarers were saying. And we have been using also for a very different uh, kind of uh, trend, I mean, ten, uh, trend in this particular research, we have been using post control officers in order to understand how the compliance monitoring and enforcement in this particular topic of rest hours is performed and what are the limitations. So basically what we've done is we try to cross check this different information and with saturation for the different groups try to, to make sure that the data we have is solid in terms of what we have. So it's a lot of cross checking with previous literature and with the three different groups. So the idea was very much to say, we have this evidence of fatigue, we have this evidence of widespread records, so what's happening really? So here basically the outcome, and it will be very fast because we have very limited time, it's much bigger than that, but let, let's see the, the biggest one. Uh, here we, we, we noticed a very unexpected recording practices, many different recording practices, which are not very, helpful in terms of having accurate reports. First of all, the, C the CIFARES highlighted, and not only the CIFARES, some other groups highlighted also that recording hours is taking time, it's, it's burdensome, and it's considered as, as a bureaucratic exercise and a paper exercise. So basically people do not take very much it as seriously as it could be. Uh, we also relay, um, um, I've noticed that uh, the recording itself of rest hours and work hours is not done. The day itself is usually done many days before, a few days and sometimes a few weeks. And sometimes it's even done in advance, like uh, you prepare it for the next month, which is a little bit strange for a, an operational system with a lot of unpredictable elements. We also noticed, and this is very worrying, some uh, com I mean, some ships, because it's, it's not the companies themselves. It's very much the ships, how they organize these recording practices. It's not the companies, and we have to take care about that. And I agree with Stuart. Sometimes the seafarers think that they understand what the company wants, and probably they don't. Uh, on ships, sometimes you have some person which have been appointed in order to prepare the the record for the other type, for the other crew. And this is something which is very worrying. It's not always the, the seafarer which is reporting, but somebody else which is reporting on behalf of the captain or of the head of department. We've noticed also this pre and post adjustment. And here it's very much to erase any non-compliance. So you do the record when the record highlight compliance, uh, non-compliance, just erase it and, and you adjust it. We also noticed a very interesting use of softwares. And here some of the respondents said, the softwares deemed game for success. It's basically they have been built in order to detect, detect easily and to erase evidence of non-compliance. And this is a very interesting element, the idea of how you can use software to detect and erase the evidence of compliance. And here, this is very clearly highlighted here in a very famous accident in the United States, the most um, dramatic accident in the last 30 years in the US, 
It's with the El Faro. And in the El Faro, you have exactly what we, we've seen also in our report is it gets red when it's turned red in the record, in, in the software. Basically, just manage that you're coming back to black or to green. You don't want to be in red. So basically, it's very interesting because you have this clear confirmation in casualty reports that there is this problem of using softwares in order to adjust basically the record and to facilitate the adjustment of records. So how do the CFRs justify this wrong record keeping? Basically, they justify it by saying, look, we have to do that in order to protect the ship, in order to avoid disruption of ship operation. And it looks like for them, what is really much prevails is uh, ship interests over regulation and even their own interest, because it looks quite strange that they, they accept to work beyond what is expected in terms of hours, which is against their interests. So the idea is very much, and what we think it's very much to protect the ship in order to protect themselves. There is this kind of clearly, if you protect the ship, you protect your own self. So they are afraid of sanction from the ship uh, shore management in terms of, oh, but you are reporting violations. If it is seen by a post state control officer or flag state officer, we may have consequences of in terms of uh, deficiencies that can be difficult for us after to find some cargo, et cetera. So there is a problem of employment stability also. I mean, people feel that uh, by working on contract basis, if they make something wrong or something that is not going into what they think is good for the company, they may be blamed for it and probably their contract will not be renewed. There is the idea also of uh, financial incentives, for example, over time. If you do more over time, you will have more money, but also bonuses bonuses and KPIs, which are, for example, uh, showing that if you don't have any non-compliance, basically you will have your bonus at the end of the month. So it seems like CFRs are not very much able to prioritize what is more important, the ship interest or the regulation and how to balance this and report it. What we've noticed also is the different stakeholders, maritime stakeholders, confirm basically this idea of widespread violations. We work with many different groups and, and, and a quite substantial groups of ship owners and trade organizations, as well as casualty investigators, which also highlighted this problem of uh, misreporting, wrong reporting, and recording, basically. And, and this is an issue which is quite well known in the in the shipping industry, unfortunately. And, and it's very well known also by the ship owners. I mean, you can see here this is a document from 2009, which was submitted to the IMO, which is clearly highlighting that. The ICS, or so the Ship Owners Organization, uh, wishes to adopt amendments to encourage proper record keeping and help ensure enforcement and compliance. And the idea was very much to prevent the inaccurate record of hours of rest. So, so it's something which is well known, however, it's not very much addressed. So what, what is here the role of the inspectors, port states and flag state? We, we work on port state officers for a very simple reasons, because port state officers, according to the IMO guidelines, have been previously flag state officers. So for us, we have a better view of what's happening with port state control officers. Um, basically, what we noticed is for the port state control officers, they have very limited time to do a lot of things. Uh, in some of them, if I remember some uh, MOUs, um, like in Europe, if I remember, they have about 97 items to verify in a very, very short time period. So basically when they are coming on board and verifying the rest of hours records, basically they go very fast. It's on board, yes. Does it look good? Yes, that's it. Because also what they, they explained to us, if, if you want to investigate these records and look at the accuracy of the records, it will take time. It will take a lot of time because you will have to cross check different information. You will have to use different data sources confront them and you are not always sure about the outcome. And it's a lot of investment inside. And, and what to do after? If there is violations which didn't happen in this port, but in previous ports, are you going to stop the vessel? Are you going to make a deficiency? What is the level of action you are going to take? And all this is not so clear for the post state control officers. So it, they are feeling like they're in a very slippery area, slippery grounds with low return investment. So basically the post state control officers for a lot of them, they don't go beyond what is the paper available on board, but don't forget that this paper has been prepared in order to, to make sure there is no problem. So basically you have pre 
the post-health control officer are verifying papers which have been made previously in order to make sure nothing is going to happen. So it's it's very it's a very tricky situation. So in fact, we, we find this idea that it's not it's not this easy. Basically, the enforcement as it is today in terms of flag state inspections and post state control are not this easy for seafarers. So it created this kind of normalization of dive deviance. So it's it's becoming normal that we are just adjusting and because basically nothing is going to happen. So there is this normalization of deviance, which can have detrimental consequences of a long time basis on the ship itself and on the safety of the vessel. Because if you have this normalization of deviance on one item, it can be on many other ones. So we're entering in a very dangerous area, in our opinion. Uh, in the conclusion, see, I've been quite fast. Huh? Um, the promotion, what is very important today is very much to promote accurate reporting and make sure that the seafarers understand that accurate reporting is not in always going to be um, to have retaliation uh, from the ship owner's side, but it's also a way for the ship owners to collect more data and maybe to improve the situation. So it's very important to develop this kind of uh, promotion of accurate reporting and to make sure that they implement it correctly. Port state and flag state should also enforce better the regulations huh? to have better enforcement measures and instructions to the inspectors, because we realize that instructions to the inspectors are really much missing. The initial inspection is just only asking you to verify that there is the record on board. That's it. So shore sea cooperation is very important here. And I think Stuart already mentioned it before. There is some kind of difficulty sometimes to understand one another and to understand what are the support mechanism that one can support the other one. And that's very important to improve this shore and sea cooperation, to improve trust and to improve feedback. Because when we have violations of records, which are and the record, sorry, violation of rest hours, which are make up in records, basically it's a problem of feedback mechanism. The feedback is not going to the, to, to the shore for many reasons. Huh? The seafarers highlighted that very often when they provide feedback to the company, the company just ignore it. They don't even reply. Or sometimes the company say, no, it's wrong. You don't know how to manage your ship. You don't know how to run your ship. So you are a bad captain or a bad chief engineer. So basically there is this need to elaborate um, trust and to create trust much better. Also, there is a, a very important element which has been highlighted by uh, many participants was the need to align uh, rest hours with evidence-based research on fatigue. Because here, the thresholds, which is allowing between 91 hours a week to 98 hours a week of work without violation, is something that a lot of them can say is it really possible to achieve any kind of fatigue mitigation with this kind of threshold? Finally, what is very important, and here is more probably, Anissa will probably have some, uh, some, some ideas and some, some, uh, some elements to, to reply this, is how we can promote stringent, objective, and research-based models for determining safe mining, but also as monitoring tools to understand what's happening on board ships. And what is, and it was again highlighted by Stewart, the, the idea of Big Brother, but it's probably something that needs quite a lot of, uh, of discussion. To develop tamper-proof record keeping. Tamper-proof record keeping means the capacity to record without manu manual input, but also to avoid any kind of external input, like uh, administrators with super user rights that can at the end manipulate either on board the ship or on shore the record. And for that, we need very much the participation of companies, maritime education and training, insurance, seafarers, port state controls, etc. the maritime stakeholders as a group. So the idea is very much to try to develop and implement effective uh, fatigue mitigation tools. Thank you very much. That's it for me. Oh, that's great. So I think we're getting a picture here of what good software and bad software is. So bad software, who knows where the plan comes from. It's uh, really bureaucratic and difficult to enter your records. The uh, encourages people to lie, whereas good software, um, we've got everybody involved in making a good plan. There's uh, the whole system of reporting, what you can done it can all be done automatically through the software and uh, nobody's got any incentive to lie and you've got a pretty good record of where the records came from because it links to the plan you had in the first place. So hopefully that sets up Anissa's talk. Um, we should have some time for questions at the end, by the way, if you'd like to enter any questions in the Q&A box. But I'd like to invite Anissa. Cheers. Yes, thank you. 
Um, I will just share my screen. So, yeah. So, welcome also from my side to this webinar, and I hope you can see my presentation. Um, thank you also for to to Stuart and Raphael for the very interesting, um, very interesting presentations. Um, as um, to 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 not to repeat all what has been said, I'm going to give um, some insights into what we are doing at Fraunhofer to tackle the problem of uh, of planning, which seems to be a quite complex problem. So basically, we have. Um, been developing software and methods to um, determine in a reliable way an adequate crew consistency and work schedules for a given ship when you take into consideration the human resources, basically the qualification, the maintenance, um, and of course the regulation. And I have uh, last week I gave some, some insights to what we do for, for gathering the data in order to enable all these algorithms to calculate work schedules and crew demand. Today, we will see how we, how we use the algorithms, how do they work, how do we integrate mandatory um, tasks into the schedule together with the plant maintenance. And uh, this is what we call at Fraunhofer SCADA's office module. So we have two modules, one for the, for the ships and one for the office to provide them with work schedules and to what also Stuart said, um, a forward planning. So a decision support tool for forward planning that takes into account ship, the voyage, the workload that must, must get done on the voyage by the right persons, and in such a way that every one of them uh, is compliant with the work and rest hours and specific company requirements. And um, this is the main aim. This is our main outcome. We want to have a plan in a very detailed way. We have gathered those kind of, of, of tasks um, last week, as I explained. So we had some, some models to, to document not only if, first, if, if someone has worked, but what has he worked on, so the task. And now we want to have a very detailed work schedule that includes watch keeping. You see here that watch keeping part, this is the 4-8 pattern, but we can also simulate the 6-6 pattern. I know also from a lot of shipping companies and my visits on ship that there are some, some ships do not really have many officers to run always the 4-8 pattern and relieve the chief to and go for 6-6 during the port stays or during a very short period of time when they have a lot of port frequency. And um, we have included here the task that we call our mandatory for a safe ship voyage, like mooring, pilot takeover, administration for port authorities, for superintendent or what, whoever visits the, the ship. Um, bunkering, cargo handling uh, tasks, and, and you see the, the green line are the plant maintenance jobs that come from the plant maintenance system. Main aim of, um, of this algorithm is to put, of the, the algorithms that are, are running behind the, the software is to put the, uh, the task on the right time to the most to the best qualified personnel for it in such a way that they all are compliant with rest hours regulation. And maybe um, a, a little deeper look into our voyage handling. Raphael mentioned that port states control, they need to look at different information resources to gather, to, to put together what is the work that must have been going on on board. And this is for, for, for SCADAS, the, the voyage. The voyage is the main resource of, uh, of the workload. We define the, the voyage in, very, in a very detailed way in what we call ship operating states that basically represent the operational states of a ship. And if we take a deeper look into a, a ship, a container ship approaching the port of Hamburg, when, where Fraunhofer is also located, um, we uh, can see, okay, we have a pilot takeover for half an hour and we do some narrow water maneuvering into the Elbe River and we have two more pilot takeover before, before we arrive at the port. And when the port stay begins, before the port stay begins, of course, some berthing maneuvering. And during the port stay, we additionally know we have some additional work like cargo handling, bunkering, supervision loading, uh, doing some authority work or administration work, and everything is put in a holistic view into that voyage. The voyage determines 
the time uh, limits for the tasks. So there are some tasks that must be done during the pilot takeover from 3 to 3.30, and some other during the whole course day. And this is how the, the, um, the scheduling algorithm know when, when is the right time for the task. And by planning, um, this, this is the main input, so the voyage. We, do, we know when the task should happen, and we also have some base data defined by the shipping company itself, which uh, say, okay, the task uh, must be done by the master alone, but if he cannot, then maybe he, the chief officer can overtake it, and the ratings, um, maybe some tasks are also dedicated only to the ratings, and the algorithm takes those tasks, put it in the right time, and checks if some, if, if the qualified person is, uh, has free time to do the task, then assigns it to him. If not, if the rest hour, if it's not rest hour compliant, if you assign the task to that speci special person, then it will be either assigned to another position that, uh, that has enough time for that, or because we are here at the simulation part of, of the algorithm and not on board, it will take one guy more. So it will take in to um, increase the crew consistency. And basically, this is the main outcome to calculate the minimum crew consistency, the minimum crew size that you need in order to handle the whole workload during the voyage um, in a rest compliant way. And we see here some some of uh, the STCV rule sets. So we take them. This uh, this is these are the rule sets that we take into consideration when the algorithm tries to to plan the work to the specific person. Um, where the 10 hours into any 24 hours and their division into no more than two blocks, one of them to be six hours long. We can also map, um, all these rules are quite parametrized. We can uh, map other uh, also different specific flag states rules, like I know that the German flag does not allow the exceptions and other flags do allow the exception and they have some kind of discrep uh, discrepance between a maximum work and uh, minimum rest in seven days. And this, everything can be mapped, it's, it's not a problem, so we can parameterize it and you can define your own um, regulations. And uh, at the end, calculate how does do they impact uh, the crew sizes and uh, the safe manning. And maybe this is one one more um, further actor that could be interested in such a method, which are the flex states, which define the minimum safe manning to see what happens if I change my rules. What the, how, what does it mean for for my crew consistency? Maybe before moving into the plant maintenance, because this was our main topic today, is um, this is the first schedule that we get out of SCADAS if we don't consider plant maintenance. So the tasks that are mandatory for safe ship voyage are assigned to the persons that we see here some uh, wide spaces. The wide spaces um, mean the uh, are buffer for, for the person. So they um, we just consider the tasks that are mandatory for a safe ship voyage. We don't consider everything that happens every day on board. And of course, we see here how, man, how much buffer, how much time do specific persons, specific position on board have for, for example, plant maintenance. And at that point of time, we consider the plant maintenance tasks and try to fill in the gap with this plant maintenance, of course, by taking into account the work and rest hours in such a way that the maintenance tasks are done, if possible, within their due date. And that's a very good method to check um, how do, does your actual or maybe future uh, plant maintenance um, strategy impact the workload on board. And of course, plant maintenance strategy for an older ship looks different than one for a new building or for a ship that's, that hasn't been really maintained the last years. And you can calculate exactly how many people do you need additionally, maybe for your riding crew that could help with that maintenance peak, or maybe for the next voyage at all um, to, to make a kind of, of um, quantified assessment and decision support for all these questions. Um, this is another view of our work schedule, is the crew demand. So basically to, to look at this safe manning or to compare it with a safe manning. And as you have said, of course, you have peaks in, in ports. In ports, you have a lot of works and then you can um, you, in a, a de um, calculate in a very detailed way which are the persons that you need more, which are the positions where you need more persons on board to handle all this workload. 
And of course, you can do the same by doing it with the plant maintenance and without the plant maintenance. Or if you are introducing some new technology like condition-based monitoring, you can also calculate how does it impact the workload and what does it really uh, lead to less work? Um, or how is the work distributed if you have more higher, automa uh, higher automated systems? Like we are always talking about the autonomous ship, but uh, what does it mean for the workload of the persons who still have to take care of these uh, systems? Well, uh, to, to, to conclude, I would like to, to tell uh, to, to um, yeah, give to you some benefits that SCADAS uh, has is, of course, the optimized crew demand the assessment of time, as I explained, which is available for maintenance tasks. You can do risk assessment regarding adherence to regulatory compliance, see what happens if you, if you, if you just um, decide that the rules are not to be compliant. So which are the guys which will be non-compliant? Um, of course, transparency through data-driven basis for discussion. You have you work, you discuss on data with everyone in your company and not on experience. Uh, you can run as it is an office tool. It's just decision support tool. Uh, you can run whatever what if scenario you want to run. So you can just calculate on on office space before putting all the strategy on the ship and running the ship six months with an experiment. The, um, you can just run here different scenarios and make a calculation and then decide which is which should be maybe the, the most suitable um, strategy to run on ship. And of course, it, it helps it, it, may, it helps for informed decision making process and cooling budgets, which is for many shipping companies one of the biggest cost blocks. And I'm also done with my presentation. Next week, uh, I will give a look what, how, how do we uh, do the planning on board. So we have the SCADAS, SCADAS on board module where we don't have theoretical um, many seafarers, but only 23, 25. And these guys must be, um, um, needs to be scheduled um, in such a way that it is um, as, as compliant as possible. And we will take a look into it in, uh, next week. Thank you for listening and I'm um, looking forward to have good discussions. Well, thank you. Well, that's, that's great. So got some amazing questions come in. I, I thought there's um, this overall theme is sort of the realisticness of what we're proposing here. Um, so we had a question from Dimitri Liras is saying maybe it's a, so it's inherent in the way shipping works that ship owners want to keep the hours down. So they've got a kind of conflict which we can't get away with better planning. Um, Sergi Dabiza, who's um, from uh, I looked him up, but he, he's uh, he's talking about uh, from Exmar. He's saying that uh, when ships are in the Persian Gulf, they're not given berth any instructions when they're at anchor, so they can't even do the planning. Um, George Zagrafos, who's a uh, vessels manager with the Columbia, is saying that charterers are the stakeholders, and how do we get them involved if they're to think about maintenance? Akram Bubaka from Bourbon Marine is asking about how we break down the maintenance task. Um, so maybe, maybe if I go to Stuart and then Raphael and then Issa, um, if you want to pick up anything, you, you, take, take your interest in these. But I think, you know, the theme is how realistic is it to think we can have really great planning software that does everything perfectly? Is that something you'd like to pick up on, Stuart, do you think? Uh, look, I think no one's saying it's uh, easy to to achieve planning. And of course, all the questions that, that or most of the questions here are indicating that you know, in shipping and, and most ships programs, there's many, many occasions of very short notice changes, you know, instant things you expect to be, you know, at anchor for another eight hours or 12 hours. And then, as I said, suddenly the pilots arriving in 10 minutes, you know, and that does throw uh, a lot of your planning completely out the window. Um, you know, we, we need the software, we need to get better at the software, of course, as, as um, Anissa and, and, and Rafael is explaining. Um, th there's always going to be the challenge of the, the short notice, but if you have a good framework and, and, and a plan and you've involved all, all the people, it becomes easier to change it. That, that I think is my, my key message. I, I, I talk to many seafarers on board and, you know, some of them say, well, we don't have time. We're too busy to plan. We don't have time for a meeting. Um, and we don't need a meeting because I see the guys all the time every day. I see the guys at meal times. I, I talk to them all throughout the day. Why do we need a planning meeting? Um, and I can see that. I can understand that kind of approach. But um, 
if we force ourselves to more, more rigidly um, have regular planning meetings with the right people around the table, you can get your scheduling even more refined and able to be changed at short notice quickly uh, with the options on the table without, without starting from scratch again. So that's, that's just one of the things I, I, I tend to think about. Wow, Raphael, do you want to uh, pick up on any, any of those questions under the theme? Is it realistic to think we can have great planning tools that do everything perfectly and uh, get rid of this bureaucracy and incentive to uh, falsify? Yeah, I mean, it's a uh, it's, it's very interesting discussion. There are many things to say and, and yeah, we, we can go very much further and far. I, I think very much we have inherently a problem of logic. What is first? What is first? Um, and here I will make a, a kind of, um, of comparis, comparative analysis with what we have in the Navy and shipping. In the Navy, the plans are before the action. So you are not going in, in the blue. You prepare yourself very clearly because you know it's very high stake. If there is any mistake in the plan, maybe you are going for a defeat. So you need to have a very strong plan. And this is how you construct basically your operation system, which makes a lot of sense in the context of the Navy. In the context of shipping, the logic is different. What we have in the middle of, of the shipping is a commercial operation as the core. We want to make money. This is a commercial operation. And everything which is around, and we are talking about plan maintenance, we are talking about any form of activities which is not directly connected to the core, basically it's becoming secondary. And, and what was, was highlighted by, I, I see some of the QA question, how is it difficult with them? It is like this, because in shipping, we have to perform in terms of, it's an economic activity. W what is matters is that we multiply as much as possible commercial activities in order to generate income, in order to have the possibility to manage, uh, I would say maintenance and so on. So basically the core of everything is the commercial activity. And the commercial activity have its own pace, have its <laughs> own negotiation power. Uh, ju just to give you an example, uh, th there is also something which is very typical from shipping. What is expected in shipping is the ship to adapt to the other conditions. And this is typical. For example, you have, uh, as mentioned before, you have a ship which was supposed to, to leave the terminal, the oil terminal, I'd say at 1600, but due to whatever problem of disconnection related to untidying bolts, which were whatever problem it is, it's losing time. But the next vessel, will be also affected by this. And after it will affect a long series of ships. You can have the same thing, like you, you want to arrive in Japan, I say in Japan because it happened to me years ago. You want to arrive in Japan, you have a very big storm. So what's happening here? If you have this very big storm, you cannot manage your, your basically your scheduled plan in terms of maintenance that you wanted to do during this period because it's not possible anymore to do it. In addition to this, you are going to modify the commercial schedule for your ship and for the other ones. And it will have a cascade effect on the capacity to run the business. So it's super complicated here to deal with it. Uh, I, I would not be negative here and I just say it, planning is not good. Planning is super good. But we need, uh, as Stewart was saying, we need also to have a certain buffer of capacity to absorb these permanent changes that you have in shipping, permanent changes, systematic changes. And in order to absorb it, we need to have a less tight, probably, schedule, or at least a less tight uh, manpower or so on If we have a little bit more manpower, probably some of the maintenance tasks would be optimized in a different way. You will probably be able to do it while you still have this permanent uh, in predictability and a normal situation, if you have more capacity on board. And here we arrive to another kind of discussion. Um, do we really need to optimize more what has already been optimized, historically speaking, for 500 years? Because the shipping and the shipping operation has been optimized, economically speaking, I'm talking economically speaking, for 500 years in terms of crew. So it, it's, it's, we arrive in a moment that probably instead of looking for optimization, saying, look, we want to optimize what? Are, are we not already at the end of it? And, and when we see this permanent violation adjustment of record, is it not a sign of probably we've been a little bit already too far? Uh, and here I just want to make a small parallel just to give you an idea of where we are in shipping compared to other 
kind of operation system. If we compare shipping to a very simple system, which is generating energy, which is a power plant. Okay, a power plant is generating energy, like a ship is generating energy. Power plant is generating energy for the electric network, and the ship is generating energy for its propulsion and commercial operation. But let's make it like super simple. Okay, when you look at the amount of people which are running and working in a power plant, we're talking about hundreds, hundreds. And sometimes if you have a very big ship, because I was master on a very large vessel, uh, what we're producing, hundreds megawatts, is basically what a, a power plant is producing. With, we are producing the same type of energy only. And I'm not talking about the complexity of the ship operation, the complexity of the different areas that we're entering in. No, no, I'm talking only on power generation. We are generating the same amount of power of a power plant of the same size with five to 10 times less people on board. So here, what we see, we, we see a system which has an incredible- I'd like to give Anissa a chance to speak before we finish. <laughs> sure, sorry, sorry. So, so we are in a system which, is, which has been optimized for a very long time. And, and we have to take care of how far we can go. Okay, and, and how much we can try to go with the head of, of the softwares. Um, yeah, okay. I, I will not expand too much. Because I, <laughs> But that, this, these are very good points, uh, Raphael. And uh, what we meant by SCADAS is to give the per, to give the shipping companies and other actors the possibility to calculate, to make a quantification between the workload and the crew size by taking into account the rest hours. And you can do it in the two directions. You can say, take the workload as it is right now and calculate me the real crew size, which maybe could be higher than the one that you are running on. That's the safe manic is saying. Or the other way around, you uh, you say, okay, then do do the workload or optimize the workload in such a way that that we run it with 20, 20 persons. But then I cannot really run the whole maintenance uh, the whole maintenance jobs. So you take a list of jobs that could not be done uh, because it's it's not possible to do it within the the rest hour compliance stuff. And to come back to the one question with the port planning in the Persian Gulf area. Um, yes, uh, we are aware of that. It's not only there that you uh, you have at the very short in short term changes in the voyage. And the main advantage of having of having such a system is just that you can simulate it. You can say, okay, I will come, my pilot will be uh, two hours late. Now um, let the let the program reschedule everything with this two hours lateness. It's a new voyage, and this is much easier to to do it on a program than to do it manually. So I, I I know that all the feedbacks has been we don't have time to plan because it's of course com complex. You need to take uh, to take care of about four different aspects for each of your um, crew, and your crew is twenty five persons. And that's not really easy. That's nothing that can be done by by the by manually in an optimal way. Oh well, we're coming up to the end of the hour. Um, some fascinating ideas here. Um, Stuart, would you like to take a minute or so for closing thoughts? Uh, well, uh, I, I think uh, it is interesting, and and thanks to Anissa and, and Raphael for for their input. Um, and Raphael's got it, you know, um, there. It's it's all about the economics. It, you know, will the shipping industry ever change um, between the demands of the ship owner and um, uh, and the vessel? Um, oh. uh, we just have to keep working hard at optimizing uh, what we can do for the seafarer. And I still think that's one of the things. The seafarer is the guy that earns us the money. You know, without him on that ship, uh, that's that's uh, you know. Uh, not going to happen and we need to focus on that and I, I think we need to do as much as we can to support and help and, and build that relationship between um, you know the office and and the vessel uh, because you will get better performing vessels if you build that that relationship uh, and using software like Anisa's uh, you know it all helps to getting that, that that combination so seafarer is king Oh, that's a fantastic way to finish. And since we have a Royal Navy guy on board, we shall uh, finish on time. I shall pass back to Visor for the closing words. Cheers. Thank you. So we covered the second part of series, making crew planning easier with Bronkhofer CML. Join us next Tuesday on May 18th, while we will be discussing crew deployments on board uh, vessels. Again, with Anissa and Carnival Maritime as our guest speaker. Digital Ship is signing off. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.
Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Goodbye.